but how to bring about this utopian empire. In his writings, Sir Francis Bacon called for a universal reformation of the whole wide world. To bring about this reform, some believe the secret societies launched a world revolution. People do not understand that our revolution was the first in a series of revolutions uh, that began in 1776 and extended right up until uh, the Cuban Revolution in 1959 when Fidel Castro came to power. And this is a series of revolutions to transform the world. While most Americans did not fight the War of Independence for the cause of global revolution, it is undeniable that secret societies played an important role and that many of America's founders were Freemasons. Many of them were Masons, but they were in, in, into Masonry uh, because, of course, this was the only way that they could protect themselves. This was the only way they could keep from being found out. So the, they were plotting a revolution. They had to have a means of maintaining their secrecy. I think Masonry was, in fact, used as a built-in network, a secret network, in which to foment the American Revolution. They didn't have to put a network together. It was already there. All they had to do was, cause, was sort of ride on the back of Freemasonry to make the American Revolution work. And work it did with the help of Masonic ingenuity, beginning with the kickoff event, the Boston Tea Party. And what was the Boston Tea Party? Who was behind that? What was, who were the raiders of the, the English tea ship? Admittedly, at this point, it was the Masonic Lodge in Boston. They were all Masons. It was the Masons wanting to implement this revolution. The leader of the men who dressed up like Indians and threw the tea into Boston Harbor was the legendary Paul Revere, whose famous ride would alert Americans that the British were coming. Pictured here with a teapot commemorating his rebellion, Paul Revere was a prominent member of the Masonic Order. George Washington, known as the father of our country, along with many of his generals, were also Masons. Yet Washington's involvement with Masonry is hotly debated. Our information is, is that he did not do anything with the Masonic Lodge for the last 30 years of his life. The debate centers around a letter written by George Washington to the Reverend G.W. Schneider on September 25, 1798 just 15 months before Washington's death. In the letter, Washington says specifically, I must correct an error you have run into of my presiding over the English lodges in this country. The fact is, I preside over none, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. It is only fair to mention that many Masons continue to insist that Washington was very active in the craft. Yet there is no debate about the Masonic membership of Benjamin Franklin, who is deeply involved not only with Masonry, but a whole variety of secret societies in America, in England, and in France. Societies that had everything to do with his success during the American Revolutionary War. Benjamin Franklin is a very paradoxical, complex fellow, as might be expected for someone who is such a great genius. But um, at times he seems like he's a Christian. At times he seems like he's a scoundrel. At times it seems like he's a Luciferian. And at times it seems like he's a Rosicrucian. He was a, a strange character, Benjamin Franklin, a sort of a shuttle diplomat between Philadelphia and Paris and London, England. He was, of course, an ambassador in Europe, and when he was over in Europe, he became a member of a group called the Hellfire Club, which was a kind of pseudo-satanic organization in the 1700s. It was founded by an English nobleman named Francis Dashwood, and it basically existed as a place where men could gather and have orgies and worship the devil and basically get loaded and do whatever they wanted. <laughs> Under the guise of it being a satanic society. 
The Hellfire Club was a part of the so-called gentlemen's clubs of 17th and 18th century England. While the debauched behavior of these groups was initially tolerated, once they began to dabble in satanic rituals, they were forced to go underground, literally. Obviously, it cannot be said that Franklin's involvement with the Hellfire Club is to be fully equated with the often crazed activities of a man like Crowley or even Timothy Leary. Still, one must wonder what Franklin was doing with a group of immoral aristocrats who dabbled in devil worship, even if they were just kidding around as some have suggested. Is it likely that this legendary founder of America, the man who discovered electricity, invented the bifocals, and co-authored the Declaration of Independence, simply spent his time in England getting drunk and seducing women? Franklin was known to be a crafty fellow. Could his dealings with Dashwood and the Hellfire Club have somehow been a part of a greater agenda? After all, Sir Francis Dashwood was no ordinary drunken rake. He also happened to be a member of the British Parliament and was a close friend and advisor to King George III, the man the American colonists would rebel against. The Hellfire Club itself were made up of English nobility, some of whom held high offices in the King's government. Was it mere coincidence that these men, close friends of Franklin, just happened to be in power when the British were defeated? In his book, The Occult Conspiracy, author Michael Howard chronicles how Benjamin Franklin came to England in 1758 to discuss the future of the American colonies with Sir Francis Dashwood. Meanwhile, British historian Richard Deacon, in his History of the British Secret Service, claims that Dashwood's Hellfire Club functioned as a center of English espionage. Because of Franklin's many clandestine activities, some involving a British double agent named Edward Bancroft, Deacon and fellow historian Professor Cecil B. Curry speculate that Ben Franklin may have been a covert spy for the British government, known either as Number 72 or with the code name Moses. But was Franklin working for the British? Or were secret powers within the King's own government working with Franklin for the ancient plan of all secret societies, the New Atlantis. Why would British intelligence refer to Benjamin Franklin as Moses? Normally, enemies are given names like Carlos the Jackal or the Butcher of Baghdad. But Moses? Was the name itself a kind of cipher or secret code? Had they already determined that as Moses led the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, so Franklin would lead the American colonies to freedom from King George. Could this be why Benjamin Franklin's initial design for the Great Seal of the United States was that of Moses standing on the shoreline of the Red Sea as the waters destroyed Pharaoh and his army, with the motto, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God. Coincidence? Maybe. Yet in his book, America's Secret Destiny, author Robert Hieronymus, whose doctrinal thesis on the reverse of the Great Seal has been used by the White House, the State Department, and the Department of the Interior, makes the comment that Franklin's design for the seal represented, quote, how he viewed America's birth and destiny. Did Franklin really see himself as Moses? defeating King George, the colonial pharaoh, with the help of Dashwood and the Hellfire Club. Franklin was a member of Masonic and secret orders in America, in England, and in France, the three countries involved in the American Revolution. But some researchers argue that his influence in France truly demonstrates his loyalty to a plan that looked beyond America, to a global revolution. He was the master of the uh, uh, Lodge of the Nine Sisters, Nochois, the Lodge of the Nine Sisters right in Paris, and that's where the revolution started, incidentally. So he was lodge master there every time he visited the place. 
He, as so many young people, very intelligent people, really believed that man could create a better society without being totally reliant upon God. And of course, we know that he eventually he went to France, and he was when he was in France as the American ambassador to France, uh, he was instrumental in pushing these ideas that led to the French Revolution. Franklin went to France to convince King Louis the Sixteenth to finance the American Revolution. But in the process, Franklin was preaching radical ideas that would later on inspire the French to overthrow Louis the very monarch who had helped to pay for the founding of America. Americans desperately needed money to fight the War of Independence because, according to Franklin, England had ruined their economy to keep America from becoming too prosperous. When he was ambassador to England, um, the Bank of England said, how come America, the, the representatives of the Bank of England said, how come America is getting so rich? And Franklin, said in his autobiography, recounts the story. He said, well, that's easy. In America, we create our own money and we owe no interest to pay to no one. Uh, so the Bank of England said, oh, that's very interesting. So they immediately had passed through Parliament the Currency Act of 1764. And what did the Currency Act do? It outlawed uh, the creation of America's own money and made um, put America on the gold standard, made Americans pay their taxes in gold or silver coin, which of course was very scarce in the American colonies in those days. So what was the result? It, it immediately plunged America into a deep depression. Franklin says that this, this depression, and uh, uh, everyone in America was well aware of what the depression, who caused the depression, why it was caused, just because England outlawed America just simply printing its own money, and that it was this uh, Currency Act of 1764 that was really the root cause of the American Revolution, because it caused uh, so much unemployment and uh, uh, a terrible economic upheaval. And Franklin's quote is, we could have endured a little tax on tea and other matters, but it was England's taking away our ability to create our own currency that was really the root cause of the revolution. And so King Louis supported the American cause through financial aid and the use of troops. But some years later, many of the French soldiers who fought for America would return to France to fight the French Revolution. Among their leaders would be an American hero, the Marquis de Lafayette, who served alongside George Washington. Lafayette was also a Freemason and close acquaintance of Benjamin Franklin, the man who seemed to be the friend of nearly all the revolutionaries of the day. It was Benjamin Franklin who initiated Voltaire himself uh, in 1778. He could then brag and say, well, Voltaire was a Mason. Ooh. People would say, if it's good enough for him, it must be good enough for me. I don't know what it's all about, but it sounds like a good thing. While the writings of Voltaire inspired the French revolutionaries, Americans were compelled by another of Franklin's close friends, Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was a member of the Lunar Society. Benjamin okay. Franklin would go and meet with them, yeah. Anyway, he recognized in Thomas Paine that the fellow was, um, he was pretty good at writing. And so he brought him back with him to Philadelphia and he wrote the pamphlets, the pamphlets that started the revolution in America. It was a little booklet called Common Sense. Thomas Paine wrote that, and it was kind of um, inciting people to war against King George III. With the help of Paine and his fellow Masons, Franklin worked to create the revolutionary mentality among the colonies. Yes, Franklin developed the concept of the virtuous revolution. The thought of revolting against a monarch uh, amongst European people was absolutely anathema. It went totally against the European mindset of the divine right of kings, where uh, government is of God, kings are appointed by God, and so the virtuous revolution was something really different. But not all Masons went along with Franklin's ideas, like the man known as the great American traitor, Benedict Arnold, also a Mason who chose to side with the British during the war. Nevertheless, for good or for ill, Masonry was clearly at the helm of the War of Independence. Masonic philosopher Manley P. Hall wrote that not only were many American founders Masons, 
but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose, known only to the initiated few. Hall further suggests that Benjamin Franklin was among those few. In his book, The Secret Destiny of America, Hall writes of Franklin's involvement with the plan of Francis Bacon. In chapter 13, titled Bacon's Secret Society Set Up in America, Hall features an illustration showing the eastern seaboard with Benjamin Franklin overseeing it, while beside him is the shadow of Bacon. Hall claims that Franklin spoke for the secret societies and that most of the men who worked with him in the early days of the American Revolution were also members. He says, quote, the plan was working out. The new Atlantis was coming into being in accordance with the program laid down by Francis Bacon. To those who have studied him, Sir Francis Bacon is one of the most enigmatic figures in world history. Baconian societies have existed for centuries since his death in 1626. All of them credit Bacon with the great advancements of the new world. <laughs>